My guest today is Richard Adkerson, CEO of Freeport McMoran. Thank you, Jeff. It's great to be here at the Cronkite School. You're a, uh, originally a boy from rural Mississippi, right. running a global company today. It's hard to explain. I mean, it's really hard to explain. I came from a family, you know, the small farmers, and, you know, who I still have uh, is respect for those people as much as anybody I meet in the world today. Grew up in small towns, Mississippi, public schools, went to a public university, and ended up just having a great education. I, I wasn't, you know, high school, I was all interested in football and baseball, among other things. And for some reason that I cannot explain, uh, I scored well on tests. I mean, I, I, I would do. I would do well in certain classes. Generally, I'd have some girl before me do my homework for me, you know, and meet. And so I just, I wasn't, I, I wasn't real studious. Wasn't good enough to, you know, advance in athletics like I, my dreams were. But when I started scoring well on test, uh, I did a graduation uh, speech at state one time. And, and all of a sudden, there was something that I could do really well in, in school, that I hadn't expected to. And I took that competitive spirit that I had for high school athletics. That's real big in Mississippi. I mean, real big. I, I've never had pressure on me. And all the things I've done in life, like I did playing football on Friday nights in Mississippi in high school. Uh, but I took that kind of spirit to try to take advantage of the God-given gifts that I had and worked real hard. I mean, made a lot of sacrifices and worked hard and, you know, things, things developed as they've developed and so here I am. When you got the offer to come to Freeport McMoran, you were told that a financial type will never run this company. <laughs> right. When I first met the company that I am in now, and this is a great American story, uh, when I finished school, I moved to New Orleans with Arthur Anderson. One of my first clients was a company called Mac Moran, the Mac Moran in the Freeport name. And there were 16 people in the company that had net income of $50,000. And they were my principal clients. So I met these entrepreneurial guys early on. Uh, the company's founders were steeped in the oil and gas business, technical types and in building a company and you sort of see this with some of the transitions that the tech companies are making today when a company is founded by somebody it generally takes somebody that has this great technical capabilities in their business and this vision this drive to build it and then you build it to a certain size and a company's um, has an evolution into how they then have to deal with a much larger organization and with the outside world and with, in today's world, a lot of government relations, labor relations, uh, uh, environmental relations. And at some point, whether you're a technical guy or financial guy, you get to a point in a company of where you're going to have to deal with things that you're not an expert in. And you're going to have to learn to work with other people to judge people, to use common sense, use your own judgment and, and instincts. And a technical guy can rise to that point, and I obviously believe a financial guy can as well. And so it, it's a, a question of expanding the scope of your work and learning how to work through others and use judgment and common sense in dealing with business problems. Tell us about the art of the deal according to Richard Adkerson. You're doing some of the largest, most complex transactions today in business. And different people have different approaches to it. For me, it's a question ultimately of establishing credibility with people. I've always been a person that can be read very easily. That's just the kind of person I am. You know whether I like something, whether I don't like something. Uh, it's impossible for me to be subtle about things like that, even though it may not be words that I say. Um, and so what I 
you've got to deal with your own personality. You can't change yourself fundamentally from the kind of person you are. But for me, in dealing with people that I'm negotiating with or people in government or with our workforce or with the press, it's, it's a question of having credibility is to have a real strong sense that what you say to people is what you mean and if you make a commitment or an agreement that you live up to that and it also requires tremendous amounts of work you have to know what you're talking about you know there's it's one thing to be smart and you know intelligence is god-given and there are a lot of smart people in the world uh, it, it, the other thing is to learn how to be diligent, you know, to understand what you're talking about in, 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 in the sense of negotiating a transaction is knowing what your objectives are, what the other company's objectives are, what their business is, how it fit together, to be informed and to, uh, to work very hard and then to approach the way in a transparent, ethical way and in a way that establishes personal credibility. Your neighbors may not have appreciated when there were protesters outside your home protesting what your company's doing in Indonesia. Here's the situation. Mining inherently has enormous impacts on the environment. You have to disturb really huge amounts of material to be able to recover, recover copper and, and, and other metals that we mine. Uh, we have mines where we move a million tons of rock every day, a million tons, if you think about that. And so that has environmental impacts. Mining also has tremendous social impacts on the communities where we operate more so than, for example, oil and gas operations, which tend to be more confined. When you look at the American West, not so much Phoenix, but a lot of the American West was built by mining activity, you know, boom and bust days. And, and so when a mine is created in a remote location, there has this tremendous influx of people that come in, and rapid growth creates problems there are issues, particularly internationally, of how central government treats indigenous populations. We have some of that here in the U.S. with, 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 with the Native Americans, uh, which is, which is uh, part of what we have to deal with. And look, I love that. Nothing I love more than the outdoors. I, it's gotten to be the joy of my life over the past 25 years. And so I have a real appreciation for people who want to preserve the environment and not see it disturbed by mining activities. And the environmental movement has done a lot of good in the world, has done a lot of good. I mean, uh, you know, unfettered capitalism and so forth can, can create harm. And there was harm done to our country and to other countries, but just think about our country first. In the American West, when historically in the 19th century and earlier in the 20th century, when people didn't realize what the impact of mining would be on the environment, and then the, from a scientific standpoint, and then there were not regulations and so forth. And so I have a real appreciation when people deal with that, and I think this movement that's built those sensitivities in our population at large is a good thing. The friction comes about because people with a particular philosophical point of view uh, oppose often any sorts of development. And what we try to do is reach out and say, let's work together to try to find ways of where we can conduct our business because the world needs our products. None of us could live the lives we want to live without the metals that we produce. I mean, copper is everywhere. You need to have energy to, to live. And uh, it would be great if we could do those things without having resource development, but you can't. And so the frustrating thing often in dealing with 
protesters and at times with uh, environmental groups is the philosophy of what they want to do makes it hard to find common grounds of dealing with things in ways that are practical. You're a public company. You work both personally as well as your team for the shareholders. Absolutely. To what extent, and shareholders are interested in profits. Those are cardinal rules of business in America. To what extent is that in conflict when you're in a country like Indonesia? How much do you have to think about profit versus how much do you have to think about the indigenous peoples and where do you draw the line? It's not a line, Jeff. It is really not a line because we can't create value for our shareholders unless we operate ethically, and that means complying with laws in the countries where we operate and as well as laws like the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and the U.S. Securities Laws. And if we are not responsible to the environment or the local people or the governments where we operate or our workforce, we ultimately can't make profits. And so it, it is not a question of A or B. To be, to create shareholder value in our business, we have to act responsibly. What do you say to your detractors if they were to listen? Historically, you had corporate executives who were so entrenched in their views, and my career now has gone long enough that I can think back in earlier parts of my career where you had corporate executives who were not at all willing to talk to people with environmental concerns. They were just so entrenched in their views that of property rights and, and, and the ability to do business that they wouldn't, be, they wouldn't listen to the other side. And that's changed tremendously. We, uh, we have an organization internationally of the world's largest mining companies called the International Council on Metals and Minings, which I had the honor of serving as uh, chairman of for two years. And our whole purpose is to adopt best practices, have companies adhere to them, monitor what they're doing, and to have interactions with global groups. I mean, you can Google my name and you'll see my picture on the website with the avatar horns on it. You can see me as Mike Myers and Dr. No. I mean, and so, it, you know, that just comes with the territory. I can tell you, you know, uh, we, we, we make a huge effort. And it goes down from our board through our senior management team to our company to be ethical, responsible, and try to manage environmental, social issues in, in, in the right way. Some people argue that foreign governments may not have the best interest at heart of their own indigenous people. How do you manage through a foreign government to do the right thing? You know, we have this uh, transition in the undeveloped world that we were going through. Uh, you probably can put a pinpoint at about 1960 when colonialism started dying out. And co countries were formed. Many of them ended up being ruled by authoritarian governments dictators and so forth. Uh, and now there's this transition of those types of governments to democracies. And in many places you find immature democracies. Uh, different countries have different views about ethical issues than we do, particularly about uh, what we call corruption here, you know, government officials participating in business. Um, and so our challenge is um, we, can't, uh, we can't go through a strategic analysis and say we want to operate in a particular company, country because that's a good country to operate in. We have to go find resources and go where those resources are and see if we can enter into a relationship 
with a host government. Virtually everywhere in the world outside the United States, governments own the resources. You know, here in the U.S., government owns certain resources, but private property owners own resources. And so to get the rights to operate, we have to negotiate arrangements with central governments. And then we're located, as you pointed out, often in places where there are indigenous people and often the relationships between the central government and indigenous people are, 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 are strained. And what we've learned is that while we have to adhere to the laws and the terms of our arrangements with host governments, we can't turn a blind eye to the local communities. And so we go further than our contract requirements to provide benefits to the local communities and employment, education, health care. That is not something that you can just say, here's a program, let's do it, and you're done with it. It's an ongoing, everyday part of our business. And it changes, it evolves, and it's never enough. You, you just, one of the things you do is when you go to other countries and you look back at our own country and think about all of the great resources, education, and benefits we have here in the United States, and yet you still see the problems of inner cities. You see the problems of Native Americans. And you realize just how tough, in the best of circumstances, it is to have social, economic development. We're struggling with that every day here in this country. And yet you go to a country that's had such a desperate history as the Democratic Republic of Congo, 65 million people in a country that's the size of all of Europe, and it has $14 billion of GNP, like $200 a person. And it has lots of resources, it has fertile ground, it has uh, the Congo River, which flows twice the flow of the Mississippi River, with these big elevation drops has a hydroelectric development potential to light up all of Africa, and yet it's impoverished. One of the great things about our, for all the criticisms we have, we go there and we've got 8,000 people working for us. And we can see education. We, we, I, th I think it's something like 35 villages that we brought fresh water to. You know, we're dealing with malaria in an effective way. We're dealing with HIV AIDS problems. Uh, and you, and, and, and uh, so the development is happening. The more we develop, the more people want. You know, the more they ask for, the government and other people ask for more, so that never ends. But it's a, it's a great satisfaction in our, our work as well. The New York Times declined to publish a letter you wrote about their alleged, about your alleged, their accusation that you paid local military and police officers to spy on environmental activists. And the reason they didn't write, uh, report your letter is they said it was too long. <laughs> so you wrote a shorter letter, but apparently they didn't print that either. Your letter said, far from causing breathtaking environmental damage, the area affected by our mine was revegetated and the downstream estuary was a functioning biodiverse ecosystem containing abundant fish and shrimp. Now, is that too pretty a picture or explain to us what really happens in that part of the world and why isn't the media willing to report it? It's not too pretty a picture because it's factual. And I will tell you, I'm not at all defensive about what we've done there. But here, here, here's where we are. We're in the middle of New Guinea the island of New Guinea. Our mine's at 13 to 14,000 feet, five degrees off the equator, and it rains two to 400 inch, inches a year there. We're next to a glacier, which is one of the seven peaks of mountain climbing. And then the mountains come down with a 30 degree angle to an area that's the second largest tropical rainforest in the world after the Amazon. It's an apron around the island of New Guinea. Um, the technical challenges of mining there are very significant. 
typically when you mine, you take your waste material and you develop storage uh, areas right beside a mine. But we can't do it there because it's high in the mountains and it has earthquakes. So we developed a system which was subject to an extensive environmental review and public input of using one of the rivers to transport material down into a lowlands area that we cordoned off with levees and deposit the material there. The material is very benign. When we put it down there, it, it, it smothered a lot of trees. But now the restoration works. The rivers are, have drinking water quality. There's fish in it. It was just the idea that philosophically people did not want to see us use a natural river system to take material down and put it in this area. It was the only way it could be mined there and was the safest way and the way that where the environmental matters could be uh, restored eventually. Um, that was several years ago. This system was designed in the 90s and it has been operating since 1997 and it's operated just as it was designed to do. And it's one of the great wonders of the mining industry in the world. Environmentalists would rather see our mine not be there and see that right next to us is a huge World Heritage Site designated by the UN where we don't mind, nobody touches. It's one of the great natural places in the world. And so that's the trade-off. Do you have a mine there which has more copper reserves at the time, still one of the top copper reserves in the world, uh, which is necessary and really beneficial. The standard of living for the people there have grown. We've given jobs, education. Uh, the indigenous people there are very interesting people. You know, it's where Margaret Mead did her work. Their average lifespan was in the early 30s because of the uh, living conditions that they have. Now we're having young Poplins work in our business, go into universities, living a better lifestyle, and that's, you know, that's what they want to do. Tell us about the, your concerns in this country, particularly in the areas of STEM, and why we are inadequate in terms of educating our students, even at the college level. Well, it's, it, 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 there's a real dichotomy in the United States. I mean, you hear, uh, rightfully so, a lot of concerns about K through 12 education and the lowering of standards and, and uh, the quality of education and how we as a country are slipping internationally in terms of the quality of particularly uh, science and math education. And yet we still have the greatest university system in the country and the world. I mean, in our industry, mining executives from throughout the world want to send their kids to school in the U.S. And, you know, when we go to, to uh, China and to Asia and, 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 and even in Europe, you know, the quality of secondary education here in the U.S. is, is just outstanding. And so what we, uh, there, there is a broad recognition, I think, of the need to address K through 12 education and particularly technical education. And so the good thing is there's a broad recognition of it. The challenge is there's not a consistent view on how to address it. And so that's what we're trying to, to provide support. Uh, and when we first moved to Arizona, I, I, it may have been my first or second meeting with Janet Napolitano, who was governor at the time. And she wanted to establish an administrative group within the state government of Arizona to help support STEM education. And she said, we need this amount of money. And I said, okay, we'll support it. So we're trying to do things like that. We have other initiatives to try to help with it. Huge problem. And, uh, 
and yet it's a critical problem for us to address. My question would be, why is your mind closed right now for workers' safety things, and why have you just appointed a new president director that's a former Indonesian spy if you want to promote human rights in West Papua? In a country like Indonesia, and this is true in other countries in the world, the government doesn't pay their military. And when we have a remote location like we have in Papua, to have security present, we have to help fund it. And there's an international standards group that we participate in that defines standards for companies like us to provide financial support to have security people present in our area. So it's not extortion. It is something that's been reviewed multiple times by the U.S. Department of Justice and the Securities and Exchange Commission because people like this New York Times situation were pointing fingers at us. It's in accordance with rules in Indonesia and so forth. The, the challenge we have is often how does that military presence act within the country? And so we have strong human rights standards. We have training things for them. But I will admit there are times when that military presence does things that we wish they wouldn't do, and we have to work to try to resolve them. But it's not extortion. It's not under the table. It is in accordance with the laws, and it is part of this international standards. The last one you asked was about our new president director. He was uh, a former uh, air marshal in the Indonesian Air Force, and he was the number two guy in an organization called BIN, which is the Indonesian equivalency of a sort of a combination between the CIA and the FBI. So we would be like a company here hiring the head of the CIA to be on their board, which happens pretty often. And he's an educated guy. Uh, I got to know him three years ago, and we believe he's going to be, be a good guy. I would not, you know, while the Ben organization did have responsibility for espionage, government espionage activities there, he was a well-known guy in Indonesia and certainly not what you would call a spy. Labor emerged three years ago in 2011, it's almost four years ago now, is a, is a problem for us. And we had a terrible strike in 2011 that carried over to 2012. It's such a volatile social structure. The current stoppage is a relatively small group of Papuan workers who actually are protesting the fact that management didn't penalize some earlier strikers that we had last fall. And so they, they're protesting the actions of certain other parts of the workforce and the fact that we didn't discipline more, more aggressively. This is, I, I wish we had time, this is a fantastically difficult social structure there in Papua to deal with, where you have indigenous people and different tribes. On, on the island of New Guinea, there may be six and a half, seven million people in the total island, and they speak 25% of the world's languages. People that are racially different from the rest of Indonesia, they're almost all Christians, fervent Christians. I grew up in the Bible Belt, and they, you know, they are died in the wool Christians in a country that's 85% Muslim. You know, it's a liberal form of Islam in Indonesia. But because of the racial differences, the religious differences, the tribal differences, it really, and we're right in the middle of it, it makes life real complicated to operate. And, uh, you know, safety is, our, is, is, is a big challenge for us there because of this elevation and rainfall and the nature of our work, the nature of our workforce. We've had a couple of real tough safety issues, which have been the hardest things I've had to deal with as CEO. 
but it's a it's a very dynamic situation. This is I'm, I feel confident it's going to be a short term deal, but it's something we're dealing with as uh, morning starts in Papua right now. Thank you, Rich.